computer. Hey everybody, so uh, this is Neil with the Eaton Public Library and I am pleased to introduce uh, Jennifer Kincello, who is the author of a set of mystery novels set in, if I'm not mistaken, San Francisco. Uh, around well, the, <laughs> where are they set? Los Angeles. In Los the Angeles, 1900s. okay, they were California. <laughs> Uh, just after the turn of the ninth of the twentieth century, uh, and so I'm going to let her introduce herself and uh, give us a little presentation. Thank Jennifer, you, Neil. I am. I'm just going to jump right in with my PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about myself, a little bit about my books, but mostly I'm going to be talking about um, trailblazing female cops and detectives. Um, around the world. Uh, and I will just start by saying, I was, I'm a research scientist. I'm a public health researcher and a justice researcher. And I was uh, happily doing research at UCLA. And I, one day I came across a woman who changed my life. And uh, I, I, came across an article about Alice Stebbins Wells, who was the first female cop in Los Angeles and re purportedly in the world. Um, and I thought, oh my goodness, she became a sh cop in 1910. She was the only woman on the police force with the LAPD. And I thought, wow, she was uh, something else. What a tough cookie, what a smart, strong woman. She was a former minister for her position at the police department. She did community organizing with the different ladies, women's clubs. Um, and six weeks after Alice got her badge, she approached the chief of police and got him to agree to deputize club women as officers and they patrolled Los Angeles working for free. And I want to say working for free is going to be a theme here um, when it comes to women in law enforcement. But Alice founded the International Police Women's Association uh, and then she went on a speaking circuit to promote female officers because she believed that uh, women cops could help create safer streets, improve social conditions, and improve the overall welfare of cities. And she was a genius. Yeah. Did you have, your, did you have your, your PowerPoint shared already? Oh, maybe not. That's why I was, that's why I was breaking in to check really quickly. Um, Screen share. Oh my goodness, do I have to start over? I do, don't I? It's okay. It, it, well, that's, uh, yeah, we, or we can cut that piece out where we're, we're doing the transition, but. You know what, I'll start over, but we won't, don't, uh, I'll introduce myself. Okay. And, uh, and let's see, I wanna go to. You should just have to go to the beginning. Show. What? You should just need to go to the front beginning because it should already be set. Yep, there you go. It'll oh, remember yeah, that. Right. <clears throat> okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kinchlow, author of the Anna Blanc mystery series. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing my slides? You are. Awesome. Author of the Anna Blanc mystery series. Um, the series is set in 1900s Los Angeles among the police matrons of the LAPD. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of how I came to write about early uh, women in, in uh, law enforcement. <clears throat> I was happily dancing along as a research scientist. I'm a public health researcher and a justice researcher. And one day I came across a woman who changed my life. Her, names was, her name was Alice Stebbins Wells. 
and there's not a tremendous amount written about her, but I came across a, a small article about her um, and how she became the first female cop in the United States in 1910, <clears throat> excuse me, in Los Angeles. And I thought, wow, um, I think that she was brave to be the only woman on, on a police force like the LAPD in 1910, and that she must have really been a badass. She was, in fact, a former minister, and she helped get her own position at the LAPD by lobbying for it because she believed that um, women were important uh, in, in crime prevention, um, in providing uh, safer streets, in dealing with women and children, improving social conditions, and the overall welfare of cities. Um, and six weeks after Alice got her full police powers, she uh, lobbied the chief of police and got him to agree to allow her to deputize club women who would work as female police officers for free in Los Angeles. And I wanna say women working for free in law enforcement is kind of a theme of this presentation. Alice founded the International Police Women's Association. She went on the speaking circuit to promote women in law enforcement. And she was an absolute genius at self-promotion. And one of the reasons I say this is she's widely known as the first policewoman um, and declared herself the first policewoman, but she was not in fact the first policewoman. Um, the earliest policewoman I'm aware of is Ella of Salisbury, third countess of Salisbury, um, who lived in, in uh, was born in 1187. Uh, she was married at age nine to William Longsby, had nine children, and when her husband died, she became the high sheriff of Wiltshire. Um, Ella was a successful sheriff. Um, after her stint as sheriff, she became a nun. She founded an abbey. But was she the first lady cop? I would say probably not. Um, and we're running, we run into what we often run into with history is it, it's the her story problem. We don't learn about the women, the great women in history, as much as we hear about the men. So I'm going to tell you about another or a woman cop. She's the first female cop in Canada. Her name was Rose Fortune. She was um, born in 1774, the child of runaway slaves. Her family escaped to Canada. She developed her own successful business, carting luggage from, from the docks. And she, the docks were very lawless. There was no police force in Canada uh, in local areas at this time. There were no cops. So uh, Rose took it upon herself to maintain uh, order on the docks. Somebody had to do it. She stepped up. And her strength of character and her uh, uh, effectiveness led the local authorities to institutionalize her ro role and she became formally a police officer. But in the United States, before there were police officers, there were police matrons. And that they were actually incredibly important. Um, before the 19th century, the police stations were entirely run by men, as were the jails. There were women inmates, oftentimes um, women who were inebriated, were uh, thrown into jail, and they were cared for by men. And uh, the women's Christian temperance movement visited the jails to reach out to these women who were struggling with strong drink. And what they saw shocked them. Um, you can imagine what might go on in a jail with a bunch of drunk women and uh, 
male guards. So um, they lobbied to get women in the jails and in the police stations to help protect the women and children. They were, the, they were being exploited in ways you can imagine. Um, so the men resisted. The chief of police said um, that the work would be so degrading and revolting that no pure-minded, respectable woman would want to work in the jails to take care of and protect the women and children. Um, but the women's clubs identified highly qualified, willing candidates. Um, but the cops pushed back and they did not want women to care for the, the women prisoners. They said the men could had been doing it and they always could. A uh, woman would be spying out and publishing things that should not go out to the public. So there was a lot of resistance to getting women involved. Um, they also claimed there was no budget to play, pay police matrons salaries. So the women's clubs recruited women from their members, highly respectable, highly qualified women, and paid the salaries for these police matrons. Some work for free, and they got the states to pass laws mandating that there be women in the police stations, jails, and prisons to reduce the incidence of rape and exploitation among the women and children. Um, so I censored this for decency, but um, Mason, police matrons did all kinds of things. They did work pertaining to women and children. So if there was a woman witness or a woman vi victim or a woman perpetrator, they, the, there would always be a matron present to interview these women and protect them. And they also um, provided you know, crime prevention programs. The first crime prevention programs in the world were in Los Angeles with the police matrons. Here is a, this is a 1904. This is a suffragist who is dressed up trying to demonstrate that women can in fact be police officers. And here's a, a picture of the LAPD in 1904. And um, this is uh, LA's first police matron, Lucy Gray. She became a police matron in 1888. You can see her in the front. She's the short woman. And she's standing with her daughter, Aletha Gilbert. Um, so Lucy had, I want to say, nine kids, and she became a police matron um, and moved in and lived above, among the, the prisoners. She lived above the jail, um, and she pretty much worked seven days a week and, while a relative took care of her children, and then her daughter joined her on the force as a police matron, and she was unpaid initially, and her daughter later became a a uh, full-fledged cop. But the first American police officer, I would say, is Detective Sergeant Marie Owens, who uh, became a cop in Chicago in 1891. She was a refugee from the Irish famine, a typhoid widow, and the mother of five children. And this her position evolved from a job as a lead factory inspector with the Chicago Health Department enforcing child labor laws. So at the time, children as young as seven were working long hours, paid pennies, and they were exploited and unprotected. So Marie Owens went in and started to patrol and try and make sure that factory owners were abiding by the new laws. And there was a lot of resistance from factory owners. They wouldn't let her in. They wouldn't, um, they were demanding warrants. And so the Chicago police, police department gave her powers of arrest and a badge. Um, and she is in my, I, I think she may be the first American female cop. She enforced child labor laws only, but I'm gonna crown her with the first American lady cop title. Um, 
Special Constable Fanny Bixby. Um, I love her because I, I was inspired by Alice Stebbins Wells to write my novels um, because I thought she was so incredibly brave. And I wanted to write a book in her honor. So I wrote The Secret Life of Anna Blanc um, about a young woman um, who became a police matron in LA. And I was gonna make her a cop, but as I'm writing this character, she's just not ready to be a cop. She's not like Alice who is mature and civic minded and uh, she was married and had children. And um, this character was coming, coming out off my, as I typed, just kind of coming out as this very different from Alice person. She was young, she was beautiful. She was the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in California. And she was a socialite and sort of naive and spoiled. And I was wondering, wow, I wonder um, if any, if they would ever hire a woman like her. And am I just taking liberty with fiction? And then I ran across special constable Fanny Bixby. She was young, single, lovely, and the daughter of one of the richest men in California. And she got it in her mind to become a police officer. And they gave her a gun and a badge and she patrolled the pike in Long Beach, California. She protected girls who, uh, she would patrol the whole hotel lobbies, protect girls who were being brought there for nefarious pur purposes. And, um, you know, more than once she was beaten up and yet she kept going. Her family and society were absolutely horrified, very much like my fictional character, Anna Blanc. But I didn't discover Fanny until after I'd written the novels. Uh, Georgia Ann Robinson became the first African-American female police officer in the country in Los Angeles in 1916. She was quite something um, and she, uh, was an activist for integration. And um, she was eventually, she started off as an unpaid police matron. Then she later got full police powers and a salary. Um, and her career as a police officer ended when she was um, a prisoner bashed her head against the bars and she went blind. But she had an amazing attitude and continued to be a powerful advocate and activist um, throughout her life, even after she lost her sight. This is Emma Benson from the Los Angeles Sheriff Department. She's the first female deputy sheriff killed in the line of duty in the US in 1919. And I don't know if any of you have read um, Constance Cop books um, by Amy Stewart, uh, who's a friend of mine. Um, I highly recommend Girl Waits with Gun. Um, and I, they're making an Amazon series too. But Constance Kopp was a, a real um, woman who in uh, 1915 became a deputy sheriff and uh, in New Jersey. And Amy writes about her um, and her adventures. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about female detectives. Um, Kate Wern is the first that I'm aware of. She was the first female with the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And here you can see her picture, uh, um, a drawing of her, and then also a photograph of who many historians believe was Kate Wern, um, because she would dress as a man. She foiled a plot to assassinate Lincoln, and she was a spy for the Union in the Civil War. This is Detective Constance Cox. Uh, she's the daughter of Henry Cox, who is of uh, fame for hunting um, uh, Jack the Ripper. And um, her dad was a city of London policeman and she was a private detective in the 19th century. And this lady is my favorite. Um, 
When need, in need of legal or confidential advice, why not confer with one of your own sex? Um, this is Miss Cora M. Strayer. She had her own detective agency in Chicago. Um, she was uh, everything you would hope that a lady detective would be. She slipped people mickeys and got them drunk and stole uh, compromising letters and was involved in fast car chases. And um, she hired, she was very successful and she hired a string of younger detectives to work with her. And most of them became her lovers, even though they were much younger. She was um, quite uh, high profile in the papers a lot. And uh, she even started her own all female military, mil military regiment. So if you wanna learn more about uh, Cora, I have an article about her that I wrote um, on my blog. Um, so that is, this is back to um, Alice Stebbins Wells, who, as I said earlier, changed my course of my life uh, so that I became a writer. And um, I've written three novels in the Anna Blanc mystery series. Um, all three are Lefty Award nominated, many, many nominations and awards, and they're on audiobooks. I um, really think that the narrator is really wonderful. Um, but uh, I'm going to read to you a little bit from my book. But first, I'll take questions. Um, let me see. Uh, Amanda, if you had any questions, I can unmute you here. Hi, Amanda. She's muted. Yeah, I, let's see. Here we go. Hi, Amanda. Yeah. Did you have any questions? Um, not at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, I joined Lee. I was in the middle of laundry, so. Well, that's like, okay. Oh, no. we're, we're glad. We're oh, glad no. to have you. We're glad you're here. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I was. I was just curious. Um, in terms of what were some of the the were there particular challenges? I know you talk, spoke about this a little bit, Jennifer, but but were there particular challenges um, that women faced with regard to becoming police officers um, to, that tie in with the women's suffrage movement? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I will say this: um, the only reason we have women in law enforcement is because of the women's clubs who were really, I mean, we think of women's clubs and I think people can underestimate how powerful they were. Uh, you have all these women who had no, had very few opportunities and maybe today would be running major corporations or would be, you know, practicing law or doing all kinds of things. And they were, channeling their energy into these women's clubs that really worked um, to improve society. This was a progressive era. So like the women's Christian temperance movement also fought for women's right to vote. And um, they fought for shelters for abused women, uh, eight hour work day, federal aid for education, the Pure Food and Drug Act, um, they fought for labor's right to organize, among other things. So these are powerful women. And they got the laws passed that mandated that there be women at, in the jails and in the police, um, police stations. And that, those were, that was state by state. But <clears throat> so these were, these were kind of the same women who were, they were suffragists and they were um, social activists and they're 100% responsible for getting the women hired. Um, and many of the women who were cops started as police matrons, like Alice Stebbins Wells started as a police matron and then she you know, pushed and she was a political genius 
and she became she was able to convince the chief of police to let her have full police powers. So definitely, the, it was the same crowd, the suffragists and the women cops, and they had tremendous opposition. The women did, as you can imagine, it's just not um, not seen as womanly. So. Yeah. Um, I actually um, have a question about your writing process. Like, what what do you go through to um, how you start to beginning to end? Yeah. Oh, so so I think I had two different processes. One was pre book deal, and one was post book deal. So the first book I wrote, I it was the first thing I wrote. I I had written. Um, three screenplays. And um, the second screenplay I wrote was The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. And I started with screenplays because I thought they'd be easier, but they're not actually, they're harder. Um, but they have a very specific structure, a three act structure, very prescribed, more so than novels. Um, but mm -hmm. the first book, is based on a screenplay. So it has that structure. Um, and the book that I used to guide my screenplay structure was Save the Cat. And that book is fantastic. And um, they, it, I think there's a Save the Cat for novels as well. So um, I started with outlining because of my screenwriter beginning. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the book from the screenplay and I must have, I have over a hundred versions of it on my hard drive. So I rewrote it, I rewrote it, I rewrote it, I rewrote it. And it was all like fun and joy because I had no deadlines. I didn't think anyone would ever read it. <laughs> but then um, but then I ended up getting an agent and selling it. And um, so then I got a two book deal and that was harder. Um, I started with my Save the Cat screenwriter outline. And then um, and then once I have a good version, I, I deviate, you know. Um, so, uh, but m there's more pressure. And um, I think when I first started writing it was just bliss. And then there's an element of discipline and work that now, so. Mm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah. I have a question that um, is something that uh, a, a friend of my mother's and she used to run um, some writers classes at uh, conventions. And this is something that the two of them discovered about each other. Um, that one of them writes in a linear structure, starts at point A and writes to point Z. And the other one writes point Q and then point D and then point R and then point Z and then goes back and stitches them together. Uh, I'm curious, which, you know, you said you worked from an outline, um, which of those approaches do you take? So I'll say um, <clears throat> oftentimes people who are more literary are, we call them pantsers authors call them pantsers. And those are people who don't outline, they just write um, mostly genre, a lot of genre authors outline. Um, I do a little hopping around, like my second book, I just had this, so Anna is my um, character. She's described as I Love Lucy meets Agatha Christie. So there's humor. And I have this, I, this vision of her like, in my head of her running down the beach, holding a severed head and being chased by a cop. And that is how I started my second book. And from that, my entire story flowed. So the first line of my second book is something like, Anna Blanc is the most beautiful woman ever to barrel down Long Beach Strand with the severed head of a Chinese man. And that is what created my story. Um, I was thinking about the 
Chinese fishing villages in LA. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there's my murder victim. And then I, um, I had a scene. I love this scene in my first book and then I didn't use it. So I just dropped it in my second book. It's a pretty big dramatic scene. I just chopped it out of one book and put it in the other book. So, you know, hopping around. Okay. I'm so I'm always curious because it was it was one of the things when they dis when when they discovered that they learned that you know my mother couldn't imagine writing the way her friend did and my friend couldn't imagine her friend couldn't imagine writing the way that she did so I'm always interested in kind of uh, finding out how which way people write if they're just a straight linear start at the beginning and go or if they do it scene by scene so it's always been an inter interesting question um, that I've always I've always wondered about with people. So um, how long, so you said you, you had about a hundred copies, uh, versions of your first book. How long did it take you from when you started writing it originally to when you actually uh, had it published? How long was that process? So it came out in 2015. I finished it in 2013 or I, I finished it and sold it or no, I finished it <laughs> and got an agent in 2013 and I sold it in 2014 came out in 2015 but I was working on it in 2010 I know because I have the file date but it was a screenplay at the time so I want to say it took me four years to write the first one and then once you have a contract with a publisher they tend to want you to come out with a new book every year or so. Um, and I don't, I need at least two out, two years but to get a book written and out. Um, so people tend to get faster as they get contracts because they have to. And I have friends that publish two solid books every year. And um, I am not those people. <laughs> But I have a day job at the sheriff department and I also have kids, so. Does your publisher try to push that for one year or is it in your contract that you have this allotted amount of time? I think I had a year to write it and then they had a year to kind of produce it. So it was in my contract. Now, authors are notorious for missing their deadlines because, um, you know, people get writer's block and almost everybody has a day job. <laughs> almost everybody I know has a day job. So, um, yeah, people get pushed by the publisher for sure. Go ahead, Neil. Oh, I just had I just had a question, and you may not have an answer for this. Um, we had a, a presenter who was talking about uh, sort of the history of Victorian uh, technology a while back, and I was curious the role. What was sort of the role of Queen Victoria as sort of a symbol? for the women who wound up in positions of power, such as police officers, uh, detectives, you know, as, you know, Queen Victoria as, as a powerful woman herself, how did, did she ever factor in as like a, a symbol or um, an inspiration in the, in the temperance clubs or anything like that? You know, Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And I think, you know, Queen Victoria had a, I don't know that much about Queen Victoria, honestly, because because um, before I wrote these books, before I wrote this screenplay, I, I really didn't know much about the period. And then I really learned everything in the world I could about it, but kind of starting with about 1900, mm -hmm. you know, through 19 you know, 15 something. Mm -hmm. So, um, so more, I'm more of an expert on Edwardian era. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I think Queen Victoria had a sort of interesting, I don't know. She Sometimes she doesn't come across as, she was a powerful woman, absolutely. Um, but I don't know that I, I always hear the rhetoric, the kind of rhetoric I hear from the suffragists coming from Queen Victoria. Um, they were really, um, I mean, of course, the American suffragists were very much influenced by the British suffragists. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I see women influenced by fictional um, women who were in books, fictional characters who were strong, powerful women. I mean, you have women in the sciences, women professors at this time, um, a lot of women powerful in the arts, in film and screenwriters and actors and producers who were women at the time. Um, It was a very, it was, it was interesting. Um, But even in law enforcement, like they really saw women as doing a different role. Um, really a nurturing society into civility. I don't know. Um, and uh, as opposed to just, you know, now I work for the sheriff department. So, um, and we run the jails and we'll have a pod uh, where you have up to 70 inmates living in one space. They just have bunks around the wall, not separated by anything. And you'll have one deputy in that pod as the guard and no gun. Um, And sometimes that deputy is a woman. So one woman, 69, 70 male inmates, she's doing a man's job. And um, back then it was kind of different. It was, it was almost like, oh, look, this is something men can't do. This is a special role for women in, in law enforcement. And of course, women crossed, crossed the line. I mean, we had some really, uh, Constance Cop is an example. She was like six feet tall and very burly and very physical and very able to capture and track down and tackle inmates or prisoners or, convicts or um, suspects, but um, but they still kind of saw women as, as different. They wanted to empower them, but it wasn't the same rhetoric as women are just like men. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Amanda, did you have any other questions for Jennifer? And- if you do, I'll just put that. Sorry, I had to talk to my kids about That's okay. pajamas, so I didn't want that conversation to be <laughs> flooded into here. Um, uh, n- not really. So. Amanda, are you a writer? I do write. Well, I, I write, <laughs> but I'm not published or anything. So oh, you're a writer. I'm working then. on something. Yeah. So. And I wouldn't. Mm, worried too much about that published not published thing well you know i'm just having a blast like you said with your first book you know i write when i can and it's just been a a wonderful hobby right now to do and if i get published great and if i don't you know um that's fine too i'm just doing what's enjoyable to me so i think that's the most important thing as a writer is to enjoy it. Absolutely, I agree. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, you had talked about possibly doing a uh, short reading from your book. Uh, I didn't know if you still sure. wanted to do that. I will, I will, I will. So. Um, <clears throat> so my book, it's set in 1907 Los Angeles and there's a young woman who's very sheltered. Uh, she's 19 years old. She's very sheltered, very, has a very controlling father um, and she is chaperoned. And uh, she reads books about Sherlock Holmes and, and women detectives in fiction from the day. And she's 
very smart and she's very fascinated with crime. And she is pretty much locked up in a gilded cage. So I'm going to read a scene about when she buys off her chaperone and trades clothes with her and goes to apply for a job as a police matron with the LAPD. <clears throat> In the dappled light under the canopy of an avocado tree, Anna stripped off a gown of Irish lace and stood for a moment letting the warm wind caress her. She would prefer to stay naked on a day that promised to be hot enough to kill livestock. She stood 10 rows deep into the orchard and all around her were waving branches, smudge pots and fallen fruit. She handed her dress to the widow Crisp who stood naked and thin, her own rough frock in a pile at her feet. Anna picked it up. It smelled of acrid sweat and medicine. It smelled like the widow Crisp. It was damp under the arms. As Anna slipped into it, the rough fabric scratching her skin, she thought there could be no better disguise in the world. The frock was so far from anything Anna would ever wear. It was more than a breach in taste. It was a capital crime. Her fingers deftly fastened the buttons that ran up to her chin. It fit, it mostly fit, but it strained across her bust and would need to be altered. She thought it couldn't matter for one day. No decent person would be looking at Anna's bust and certainly no officer of the law. If you burst my buttons, you'll pay for it, the widow Chris said. Anna ignored the comment and padded on bare feet through the orchard, crunching in leaves that sailed up into the wind, avoiding sticks, failing to avoid a moldy avocado that squished between her toes. Her own lilac colored shoes waited safely in the car. She put them on. Their elegant silver buckles glowed at the bottom of her monstrous frock, but the skirts would mostly cover them. She set the crank and hopped behind the wheel. The widow crisp emerged from the orchard like a pig in pearls, wearing Anna's Irish lace, smelling of amber and antique perfume. The gown caught the wind and waved goodbye to Anna like a flag. She peeled off, leaving her chaperone cursing at the side of the road, her pretty dress sagging at the widow's bus line. Okay, so now I'm gonna read. So now Anna's at the police station and she's in, um, <clears throat> she's being interviewed for her job by a very lascivious officer, Detective Wolf. In a bare interrogation room, Wolf considered Anna across a table. She faced him with an overeager smile. What's your name? He asked, leaning back in his chair, clipboard at the ready. She looked perplexed as if this were a hard question. His eyebrows raised and waited. Holmes, she said after a moment, Anna Holmes. It occurred to Wolf that a stupid matron would be worse than an ugly matron and he may as well pack it in now, but she was the sweetest little candidate he had ever seen. He enunciated clearly as if she were foreign or mentally deficient. It is Mrs. Holmes, isn't it? We don't hire unmarried women and you're not wearing a wedding ring. That's right. I mean, my ring is being fixed. Anna felt the place where a ring would be. He gave her a wide, encouraging smile at this prompt response. She sat up straighter, her gorgeous chest rising. And your husband doesn't mind if you do this kind of work? He addressed this question to her heaving chest as if the gaps between buttons were lips that could speak. No, he's overseas with the with the, he's overseas. Under the table, Anna gripped her purse so hard that the tiny beads made imprints on her fingers. He nodded, drawing two round bosoms in his notebook. How many grades have you completed in school? 12. She twisted the chain on her purse, straining the links until they pinched her fingers, plus finishing school. Good. Do you have any experience working with troubled women and children? He raised his eyebrows, hopefully. Yes, through my work with the Orphan's Asylum. And by the way, Anna's lying through her teeth. 
she's never worked for the orf orphans asylum. He leaned forward. So you're comfortable working in the uh, saltier parts of town? Yes, I like salt, Anna laughed. He chuckled with her. And you can type? Yes, she said, but I'd really like to do detective work like you. He shook his head in wonder. He liked this silly girl. There are no woman detectives, Mrs. Holmes, pulp novels aside. How many words per minute? She hesitated. 300? Wolf suppressed a grin and imagined her naked. Do you speak any Spanish? He asked. Her mouth curved into a tentative smile. Yes, a little. My Latin and French are better. Please say something in Spanish, Mrs. Holmes. Los Angeles. Wolf licked his lips. She was perfectly ridiculous, strange and mouthwatering. He had to do the hard thing, the responsible thing, no matter how good she was to look at, how amusing she would be around the station, or how grateful she might prove to be in the stables behind the station while her husband, if she even had one, was overseas. He sighed and stood straightening his uniform. Well, I think we're done here. Anna's face fell 10 stories as, she, as if she realized the significance of his words. Wolf fell with her. She seemed desperate. She'd be grateful. She wanted it. She was scrumptious beneath that ugly dress and he could tell that she wanted it so badly. He racked his brain for any reason to hire this girl, a reason that he could justify to Matron Clemens. Thank you, Detective Wolf, she said her voice unsteady. She kicked the table by accident as she stood. She dropped her purse onto the floor and bent to pick it up, the scratchy fabric of her dress straining against her little behind. Wolf sincerely regretted disappointing her. He was disappointed. She might be a bad liar, but she had nerve and she was a luscious little peach. Thank you for coming in, Mrs. Holmes, he said. She caught her trembling rosebud lip between her teeth and extended her hand. He shook it. It was as soft as petals. She let him hold it a moment too long and took a deep, sad, quivering breath. A button popped off the front of her frock, revealing an oval of creamy white. And before he could stop his mouth, it said, you're hired. <laughs> I think uh man did you have a comment on that oh I the only thing I was thinking the whole time is um I'm in the military and that is kind of very similar to how women in the military are treated so um it was spot on <laughs> uh, so I, I would say um if you guys are at all interested in the period go to my pinterest page because one of the ways amanda that i did research for this book is i collected tens of thousands of photographs from the 1900s like mm -hmm. hats shoes purses blah 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 and that's all there um on my pinterest page and I post on Facebook okay. most days, pictures and stuff, so. Do you uh, get most of your inspiration from like Pinterest and just pop on there and search whatever you're researching at the time or do you get uh, academic books for whatever you are re researching? I research more than I, I spend more time researching than I spend writing. And I, you know, I read doctoral dissertations and I read a lot of period stuff like textbooks, but textbooks from the 1900s. Like I have a coroner's manual from, from uh, like 1895, which has all their crime scene investigation techniques. <laughs> and I, I read uh, novels that my, my character would have read. Um, 
books on how to do laundry, um, books on how to be a good wife, um, how, how to date in that time or how to do courting, um, manners books. Um, I read court transcripts, did I say that already? Um, I watch films that, you know, silent movies from the time and listen to the music and look at the art and, you know, the poems. And, um, you know, the first book, I spent years researching it. I read the newspapers like crazy. Um, but then the second book is set in LA's Chinatown, which is a world within a world. And I had to start all over again to learn about that community. So that was really um, interesting for me. Do you try to travel to the places that you're writing about or because you're writing about a, a historical enough period that physically traveling there is not necessarily as useful um, as doing the, the library research? So I was, I lived in LA for many years um, and I was on the faculty at UCLA there. So that was, it wasn't until after I actually left LA that I started writing at all. I didn't write at all until I was, you know, in my forties. So um, I did go back and I went to the LA police museum. I've been to the Chinatown museum, although I kind of, feel like I, I've done so much research. I kind of know so much already. Um, but I, you know, I did a lot of research at Library of Congress and, you know, research on accents when I was hiring the actor to do the audiobooks. Um, I call museum curators. I, I go there, but it's different. Like LA is not like, um, Denver still has a lot of old buildings. All LA's old buildings are gone for the most part. So there was a big earthquake in the thirties and um, a lot of the old buildings were torn down or torn down for freeways. So. Uh, something you, you just said in there actually triggered another question. Um, so you mentioned the audiobook of this. Yeah. Um, what sort of is the, what's the, the relationship between authors and the readers of their audiobooks? Because I know like in children's, um, publishing a lot of time, the, um, the authors don't have a say at all over who illustrates their book. Mm, yeah. Um, and so, uh, when you said that, I was like, oh, I have no idea how, how are readers selected? What's that process look like? So it really depends on how powerful you are. <laughs> I would say most most um, most authors have no say over. So what happens is you sell the audiobook rights and then they they produce it. And I was pre, I'm a audiobook um, fanatic. I love audiobooks. So um, I really wanted a hand in mine and. So I produced it myself, but I got really lucky because I have um, Moira Quirk and she's done, uh, she's won Audible Book of the Year, lots of Audi and Earphone Awards. Um, she might know her from, um, she had a Nickelodeon show in the 90s. Her name was, uh, what was that called? She's Mo. Do you know what I'm talking about? She was a big, she was a big '90s television star, and a lot of men your age had a big crush on her. I forget the name of her show. Was it Guts, maybe, or something? Or, but um, she's got an Emmy. Anyway, I got super lucky because she likes the books, and so she agreed to do them for me. And she's done three of them, and I thought. I just, I, I'm the, I feel like the luckiest person in the world, so. Okay, so, but normally the publishers, uh, the publishers handle that completely. Yeah, you have no choice at all. 
<laughs> Maybe if you're J.K. Rawlings, but not yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that was kind of what I anticipated, and then you were like, and I and I selected the selected the audiobook reader, and I was like, whoa, what? <laughs> I, I, had no, I didn't think that would be a thing. I I, I auditioned thirty actors. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so. So okay, so what what does it look like to produce something like that yourself? What uh, what does that take? Uh, it's not actually, you know, a few thousand dollars, and um, you need you need a you need. To, so the beautiful part is, the book is already edited, and you want it to whisper sync with um, ebooks. So you just you're not going to deviate from what the paperback says. And the ebook says, uh, so you hire, you audition, and you hire um, an actor. But then you need you need a studio, you need um, engineers, sound engineers. Um, you need to design the cover because even if you kind of go with the original cover design, you have to redo it in a different shape for audiobooks. Um, and then you can distribute it either very very broadly. Most audiobooks are sold through Audible. And if you have an exclusive deal with them, like just Audible, Amazon, and Apple, then they give you like 40% of revenues. But if you if you don't have an exclusive deal and you are available on all platforms and it's 20% of revenues, but nobody buys, I mean, really almost all books are sold through Audible. So at least all my books. <clears throat> uh, Amanda, I didn't know if you had any other questions. Or Jennifer, if you had anything else you wanted to share, either way. I want to thank Amanda for coming to hear me speak. <laughs> and I want and I want to wish her very well with her writing. And I'm so glad she's enjoying it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for speaking. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. And don't even like, just, just go with the bliss of writing and, you know, don't feel in any way less than somebody traditionally published, honestly, just, you know, we're all writers. Thank you. And I'm going to wear my... Jennifer, thank you for coming and doing this. Uh, I had a wonderful time and I learned quite a bit. So thank you, Neil. Thank you for having me. Oh, Bye. not a problem. Um, yeah. We'll we'll hopefully uh, have you back in the future and we'll uh, keep an eye out for your next book. Appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Bye. Right. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm gonna wear. All right.